Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities around the globe. Today, we're doing a little recap on who we are, what we're all about, and just kind of that vibe for all the new listeners um, checking in about six months in going steady. Yeah, I mean, we've been doing this for about half a year, seriously, or not seriously, but, you know, just more consistently. And it's been it's been a fun ride so far. It has. Definitely, I like the podcast is doing better than I was expecting, which is a good thing, a fun thing. And thank you, listeners, for that. Um, also, on that note, for all of the the very wonderful community that's been building around the podcast, if you want to join in on the conversation, join in on the community, we've got a Discord, we've got a Patreon. Um, it's pretty active. There's lots of discussion in there, so hop in and see what's fresh. Yeah, we even have our sponsor. The- you know, Lester's Workshop, you know, if you want to grab a measuring gauge with just another Kill Team podcast logo to make sure that you're getting, you know, your accurate measurements, you know, lay that measuring gauge on the floor, get the nice clean acrylic gauge so you can measure out all of your distances. Definitely. It's definitely a nice piece of hardware. I think, Jason, you have one too, right? Oh, yeah. It's it's sick. In general, like, I've got a few things from Lester's Workshop and they're all amazing. Uh, definitely check it out. Like, he's he's got some cool kill zones. And like the like the terrain kits he puts out are great. He's got the little magnetic trays that have all the engage and conceal orders and like all your tokens and Yeah, I think a lot of players on the East Coast have his little dry erase magnet board along with his tokens. So it's like a nice clean setup. And I think he even comes with a clear acrylic case that goes on top of it with magnets. So it all like snaps together. So that's pretty cool. I mean, in terms of uh, real life stuff, what's been going on with you? I know I've been deep in the Starfield bubble. I finally finished Baldur's Gate with my friends. We took the uh, the evil path, as it were. Yeah, I'm like just familiar enough to know that there are video games out there, but I'm going to start playing video games again in like December. When you go into hibernation. <laughs> my busy season at work. Yes. Yep. So uh, work is a is a whirlwind for me right now. Um, but one of the like besides Kill Team, one of the big things that's been a, a project for me has been a, a, a board game design of my own. Um, that's been a lot of fun. The game is called The End and it's very inspired by Kill Team. Um, yeah. I've been working on it pretty steadily since February. And PDF it's looks great. Really, yeah, it's really been like it's coming a long way. Um, it's, it's basically just like, uh, a tabletop skirmish set in the apocalypse. And my latest batch has been expanding it into more sci-fi where before, as I was developing the core rules, it was very like if Tom Clancy made kill team and it was set in the apocalypse. Um, but now I am adding in like zombies and roaming rogue AI, just like kind of inspired by space Marines. Yeah. Where it's just like... Um, but it's cool. It's been a really fun project. Playtesting has been consistently positive, and that's been a big thing for me. Yeah, sounds cool. I mean, I personally, for game design stuff, I was working on my Games Workshop application, and that seems like it's been going okay. So, you know, I haven't heard anything back yet, but, you know, fingers crossed. Back on to podcast stuff. You know, we're talking about the U.S. community peeps, you know, our local communities, kind of what we've been doing. You know, I know there's a lot of newer listeners. You know, we're up to, I think, like 400 downloads every once in a while with 300 downloads where we started with, you know, like 100, not even 100, like 50, 60. So, you know, we wanted to, like, catch people up, you know, who, who your local co-hosts are and, you know, talk a little bit about what we've been up to in the meantime, outside of interviewing all of these super cool other TOs around the world from Canada to Spain. And I think, you know, coming up, we've got Australia and maybe Japan in the future, which would be cool. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, for my part, you know, my name is Travis. I've been doing Kill Team stuff since the beginning of the edition, helping to run tournaments. Uh, I saw Can You Roll a Crit's tournament report about Warhammer World, and I thought to myself, yeah, this is this seems doable. So I started running tournaments then. I've won a couple tournaments in 2022, went to the World Championships, and, you know, I've been running stuff in New York ever since. 
There's a couple other people in New York that do stuff, but I run the majority of the competitive kill team tournaments here, and I'm helping to organize, obviously, the New York Open, which I've brought up on the podcast a couple of times. We've got a collection of really strong players on the East Coast, and we've been slowly expanding our footprint into different shops. So now we're in three or four shops in the New York area, all playing Kill Team alongside our respective 40K communities. And Jason, I know you've got a really big scene as well up in Minnesota. Yes. Uh, before I dive into the Minnesota scene, I want to say that there will be a link in the description to get tickets for the New York Open. And if you haven't already, you should definitely do that. Yeah, it's going to be great. Really, really excited to run the second New York Open with a, yes. you know, a more central location compared to last year and bigger prizes and more, more stuff. Yeah, I mean, in general, I would like, now that we've got a, a nice little space for it, if you want to dive in and really get a little extra nitty gritty, uh, this would be a great time. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, for the New York Open last year, we were in a wedding venue. And this year, we're actually in a board game cafe that's we're basically strip no, not stripping but like we're moving everything around for the weekend of so we'll have ideally a 50 person gt compared to last year's like 30 person gt and then we'll have 20 people each day for narrative and we're also going to have necromunda and battletech for the saturday sundays so our goal is to have it slowly expand out to a couple more skirmish games this year and if it does well we'll see how we go for next year we're going to have custom play mats for kill team custom objective markers and a bunch of prizing for all the players who are coming so really excited to be moving up as far as um you know kind of like the scale of the event and so far you know we're about half capacity so if you're on the fence and you know you want an excuse to visit New York, this is a great one. I wouldn't suggest getting a hotel right next to our venue as we're right in the middle of kind of downtown Manhattan. But if you get a hotel along any of the major subway lines that runs in, it's really not that bad. And the subway in New York, unlike the rest of the US, is fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's sweet. When it comes, are you like including any into the dark or is it going to be like pure open? That one we're not 100% settled on, mostly because, you know, we're expecting that there's going to be some Kill Team news. So I don't want to lock the format in before the Kill Team news about whatever the new season is. I think once we get closer to like middle of October or like once October rolls around, if it feels like everything's been pretty quiet, we'll probably just lock down the format. But I would expect that like last year will have some representation from the newer set if there is a newer set. Because last year we were one of the first, or not one of the first, but we picked up in the dark and we had a all open, all in the dark day. I doubt we'd be doing all of one and the other again. We'd probably be doing what we are doing in most tournaments, which is like a mix of all terrain types. So I would expect that if the newer season plays more like open, it would feel like there's more open boards. But we'd probably have you know more representation of the newer stuff alongside the other two formats. Yeah, yeah, that sounds sweet. I was gonna say when it comes to the terrain layout, what are y'all doing about that with the mixed terrain? Do you have just a couple different sets and each one has a fixed layout, or like is it does it change mission to mission, or um, what are you planning? Yeah, I think you know our general game plan is that because we have a lot of community terrain, we loan terrain out from the community so you know when you get there everything should be painted everything will look great and all the boards will be custom made for whatever rule they're on and we rotate people through the missions good thing about the new kill team mission layouts is you know we can just go from loot to secure to capture and rotate through without it really being an issue so we can set the boards for the like objective layouts and then you can just play whichever you know, mission works. So we just rotate through missions and rotate people through maps. So the goal is you're never on the same map on the first day. Second day, generally, it's a little bit harder just because the scale of the like logistics problem of scrambling people around tables just gets that much harder. So we'll probably just have your goal be on the first day, new table every time. And we'll try on the second day, but if we get to the point where it starts being like a little bit too crazy, the only thing that we can guarantee is you're not going to play on the same table twice in a row, probably. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, a good realistic goal. Yeah. Sweet. And then uh and how many rounds is it going to be? Uh we're expecting if we get to the full like 50 people, we'll probably run like a 6 round tournament rather than it being like a 2 day 8 round affair because I think those are just a little bit too exhausting for everyone. Whereas like 3 each day is probably 
the nice sweet spot and then we're gonna have the ability to just like hang out in the shop after the first day and you know get a couple drinks in the shop which i think will be nice so it'll be a nice spot for us to cool down before we go to dinner or before people need to head out for the night yeah that's great sweet yeah really looking forward to it is there any other stuff you want to throw in there to include about like any kind of details like fun mechanics you're doing you know, for the narrative, we're going to have two sequential narratives, but each day will be its own thing. So we've got our Dentum, which is our like planet with who knows what's going on. We've got a cabal of people at the top of the narrative, along with the players on both sides helping to push a narrative. And we have we're going to have like fully custom kill team boards. So that'll be very cool. We have like the trench probably making a return for part of it, but we'll have a, a subway station with the trains and kind of like... Who knows? It's yes, be lots of different station, kinds of like topical. cool narrative terrain. Yeah. I mean, it's New York. You know, we'll have a 40K subway station. Can't, can't not have one. I love that. We got to like put some pictures on the social media once that's all settled. Yeah. Well, I think we're still settling all that terrain stuff, but we're, we are looking forward to uh, having another cool year of narrative stuff because last year's narrative was also really cool. It was just very, very complicated. So I think one of the big pieces of feedback we got from last year is that having people learn a whole new set of rules basically for you know a one of game maybe not the best and i kind of agree so this year we're keeping it focused on the kill team and keeping it focused on like the cool item designs and stuff yeah yeah so with the narrative are you is that like our spec ops rules woven into that at all or is it mostly about um a little bit of some like fun narrative stuff and then just the missions are a little extra zany yeah i think we've talked about this a couple times when we've talked about narrative i know with just a once upon a kill team i discussed how during like one day events it's nice to have like the level up but not tracking the actual leveling up system is nice so i think we're probably going to be doing aiming for that region of space design wise where like every mission someone might get hurt someone might gain a level and you know at the end of the day you'll have a you have a couple guys that are powered up but not not as much as like a two month or three month spec ops campaign where you can end up with every space marine getting like two levels and just being like insane yeah i think that's a a wonderful little balance there yeah yeah it's it's it's, it's exciting to bring bring these things to life i think i from what i understand we have a lot of custom character models being painted up and built up just for the event so that you know you'll have people to help out or to protect yeah that's fun yeah Sweet. what's going on on your end i know that you guys are planning a larger tournament and i'm sure you know there's stuff to talk about with for minnesota yeah so over in minnesota we've got an event coming up um it is the renegade open and every year there's like a wargaming convention in minnesota um it's the 18th to the 20th in november and it's like a big wargaming thing and there's 40k and there's age of sigmar and there's a song of ice and fire and there's uh like bolt action and it's all at like a big hotel and among that we're gonna throw some kill team events in which we're looking at doing kind of more of like a gt format thing for saturday sunday um so we really just kind of scrambling to get that put together um i have been in charge of that in the past and lately work has just kind of been extra extra busy so i've got some people stepping up and helping out there which i very much appreciate i assume uh will from you know yeah. the last time we had minnesota on the podcast yes dark gods and sweaticate was the episode yeah. yep, yep Will's that's uh, one. an amazing an amazing dude um he's definitely helping out a lot um that's been great um yeah so we're looking at like a two-day thing um saturday sunday and then also we're looking at doing um something chaotic on friday and some of the stuff that we've chatted about um my friend lee has really been like taking and running with that and uh will's been helping out with that as well we've just kind of been bouncing ideas around and that's kind of like a narrative thing too and um i'm pretty sure we're going to try to do that as all into the dark but with like oh, okay. a narrative thing and with some crazy rules where like every at the start of every battle round, roll a d20, and there's a couple different things that could happen, um, like loss of gravity, and now all of a sudden everyone can fly and is worse at fighting. Okay, so you're you plan to go a little bit less less serious for for the tournament, or is this on the Friday event? That's the, that's the, just the Friday event. Oh, okay, all right, that does sound that does sound fun. And the rule, you know, the core rulebook has a lot of like ideas basically for those kinds of narrative twists. 
Yes. Yeah. Last year on the the Friday event um, was a little thing that was called it was uh, Tipsy Tactics Kill Team After Dark. Mm. It was like a little uh, like there's drinks and there's Kill Team and it's Tipsy Tactics. Uh, so it's just kind of like some goofy casual games. And um, this year, instead, it's going to be like the the goofy into the dark narrative with some some fun twists. Yeah, that's definitely it sounds sounds like a fun time. You said the Renegade Open is the November seventeen to nineteen. Yeah, seventeen and nineteen. Yeah, yeah. it's uh two weeks after the uh, New York Open. Yes. Oh yeah, that should be a fun one. And how how many people are you guys aiming to get? Or is it mostly like Minnesota people come and people don't generally travel out for Renegade? Because obviously I haven't heard of it before, so first time hearing about it. Tell yeah. uh, tell the listeners a little bit. Yeah, you know we would love to get it to the point where people would uh, fly in for it. Um, in the past, we haven't achieved that yet, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe the time is, is nearing, uh, listeners, if you want to get more info, you can definitely reach out and, um, we'll get that to you. Um, but yeah, it's the Renegade open. Uh, it's been mostly Minnesota people so far. We've had a couple of people drive in from like Wisconsin and uh, like for yeah. some of the Looking other stuff, the, we have a big draw know. for like the Dakotas and Iowa and stuff too. Yeah, I'm looking at the website. I don't see kill team tickets up yet, so it's gonna be hard for us to help out on that. So yeah, make we sure get to that get that moving soon. We just had a yeah. little prod in there to to get that moving recently. Yeah, because so. I think on the core website it shows kill team, but it doesn't actually show the tickets when you go look at tickets yet. So, you know, listeners, hopefully by the time this comes out, you guys will be able to get tickets in case you're in the Renegade Renegade War Gaming's area, which is the yeah. Twin Cities. Yes, and we definitely have some listeners in this midwest region so in general swing by say hi uh yeah we can link you up with the local game nights too we've had a couple people reach out and ask how to get games in minnesota so happy to get that rolling as well um, yeah it sounds like you've got you know your own hometown heroes helping out with this one are there any people outside of will you know who has obviously been on the podcast before i'm sure there's other people over the last couple of years that have been really driving your engagement and helping to build out your local kill team community yeah with with just like enthusiasm and like helping run events here and there and like teaching new players and bringing terrain and stuff like that there's a couple people that jump out right away with uh jamie and nick and they've both just kind of been like superheroes in in being fun people that are welcoming to the community and and just like a good like a fun person to be around and and fun person to play games with and making the community very approachable. Um, I mentioned my friend Lee earlier as well. Um, same same kind of reasons. Like he's another fun welcoming person and he's stepping in to help out with the the Friday event at Renegade, which is really exciting. Um, and then I also have to shout out my friend, Charlie. Um, it's like, he's been, before we even had tournaments in stores, we were doing tournaments at his house and like, he even like threw in for his own prize support where he just volunteered to get some stuff and, and gave out sick prizes to help grow the community. And he's just been fun and awesome and super helpful as well. Yeah, it sounds like a very welcoming community. I know that last week we talked about, we talked with the Pacific Northwest about how being like aggressively inclusive is actually really important to growing the scene. And it definitely sounds like, you know, that sounds like the kind of inclusive behavior that we're all striving for when we start playing Kill Team. Yeah, that's definitely true. I would definitely say that Minnesota is way more Minnesota nice than like full blown competitive. Like our having fun and being friendly is more important than like crushing events. And I've, you know, I've had, I've had people in, in like the, the spirit of the casual games is fun is the biggest priority. So if someone's like starting to get a little tilted, like people tend to be like, well, hold on. Fun is the biggest thing. And then like people will concede things that they maybe don't need to just to make sure that it's all fun. So you know, we're we're definitely a plus on the fun and friendly and welcoming. And uh, if we want to be super tournament players, maybe we got to dial in a little bit of uh, I don't know something else. But like, also in that episode with Will, I think he really nailed it with being fun and like also competitive at the same time. So 
Yeah, I think he was talking about how he likes playing teams where he can take the gas pedal off if he needs to. So I think generally a lot of people do it with Space Marines, but you could do it with Vet Guard just because there's so many activations. You can do it with Chaos, you know, Legionary because they are so tanky that you can give your opponent like, you know, they can take a shot. Maybe not against the Plasma, but if the Plasma is already gone, you chuck a Marine out so they can take a couple shots off. I know that when I do a lot of coaching games, sometimes we just put like more orcs than necessary and just have them wander around kind of aimlessly so people can get a feel for the mechanics. So all of those things definitely do help. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, on my side, you know, for the New York scene, it's been growing a reasonable amount. We had a lot of people kind of step up this year to help out a little bit more. We've got a guy from New Jersey named Mike. He helped me go out to Goonhammer to help run the CoTO, basically. And then in the Manhattan group, there's a guy that we want to get on the podcast at some point, but he plays a little bit more 40K than he does Kill Team. But he did a lot of the Manhattan organizing by himself before there was a shop set up. So, you know, those guys are big local local superheroes. And then obviously we've got a couple dudes going to the New Mexico or the Atlanta championships this year. So it's exciting to see some of the Brooklyn guys go out. Hopefully they do as well as we think they will. So those shout outs go to Adrian and True, who are both, you know, players who are already locked in. So we'll see how they perform. And Mike Cortez of, uh, let's see. Westchester, who's a little bit north of New York, but he started playing, I think, more competitively in the New York scene. So we kind of claim him a little bit, not quite. So we've got like three players going down to New or Atlanta. So it's exciting to see that. Yeah, you know, and we've had a lot of people kind of pick up and help me coach or like teach newer players. So Calvin of the Brooklyn Strat scene, you know, he's been very helpful reaching out and making sure that newer players can get a game in which has always been one of those things that I struggle with just because I'm so far away from one of my local stores. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, being extremely nice and making sure that everybody has a good time, that's kind of a hard thing that not everyone is really well set up for. So if anyone is kind of struggling to get their scene set up, you know, know that both me and Jason and a lot of the other TOs on here have had moments where there is a struggle and, you know, sometimes you got to be relentlessly positive be inclusive just like last week's podcast host was saying the more inclusive you are and the more welcoming you are the easier it is for the scene to grow because it really is intimidating for a newer player stepping into these scenes yeah and like i mean one of the big things that got me into kill team in general was just like the community and just like having a a a group of people that like the same stuff to hang out with um and i feel like a lot of people feel the same way in Minnesota and just kind of like, you know, it's like you, you get out of college and it's like, Oh, my social thing has dissolved. Like, how do I keep on hanging out with friends and like stuff like the kill kill team community is a great way to, to get that going and just like have friends and do all that. So if you, if you just like crush every new player that comes in, that kind of like puts a big dampener on that. So you gotta remember we were all newer players at one point. Yes. And, like, we're all here for fun. So, like, don't be rude to anyone and, like, be fun and let people grow. Um, Yeah, I think the way... So, actually, uh, two guys from my local scene, Adrian, who's going to the championships, and Joey, who has been competing pretty regularly since last year, they both helped helped me TO the last tournament. So they stepped up a little bit. And one thing that I wanted to remind them of is when you're doing rules explanations, you tell people why you think the way you think, but you also give them like the rule you think it is go look it up if it works then confirm to those players like yeah this is how this rule works because you really want to show the whole chain of logic so that it's not just like you're answering a question and someone has to assume that you're correct because there's been a lot of times in kill team where people assume something and it's wrong you know one of one example recently that popped up for me was that you can't put barricades next to other barricades anymore and that was a change from crit ops that happened, you know, at the end of last year, which I never would have looked at in the past. Yeah. Uh, is that even on open? Uh, that's for that's for generic play at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So it's everywhere. Yeah. Because I know that came in with Into the Dark, but I hadn't I hadn't even noticed that it came to open. But we didn't really. Have yeah, no, it was just like that. a it was just like an extra thing that they added from what I remember, uh, which wasn't there before. So for everyone who doesn't know, you cannot put barricades within two inches of each other and on In the Dark. You can't put them within two inches of a door. So those are the the things that come together. 
But yeah, there's always tiny things that get missed. So you should never assume that you're going to be correct. I always tell people like, I'm pretty sure it's this. Let me look it up. And then I look it up and then I tell people like, yes, this is how that rule works. Just because it's so easy for people to get tripped up. Like I still learn a random, a couple things every once in a while. And I've been playing basically nonstop for the last you know, two years. Yeah, that's like the same thing for me. Like ever since the game came out, I've been playing steady um just playing a lot besides like these last month and a half but still like sticking with it and like at, at least once a month if not more um sometimes even like once a week there's there's something new that comes up that 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 I learn that's amazing um and I I shouted him out earlier in this episode and in another episode months ago but uh Jamie who I shouted out um he's always he's like the ultimate rules master for for knowing these little things and just every time jamie's at an event there's some kind of like a question that comes up i'm like oh i don't know the answer and jamie's just like it's on page 11 here we go yeah <laughs> there's no important rules on page 11 but you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah he's able to like remember all the rules and recall all of them very efficiently which is which is a useful skill not everyone's gonna be able to do it but being able to teach people like this is how you find the information, I think is a really important part of getting people up to a better standard of play rather than just having one person tell you the answer. You just take it as a given because it's very easy for things to be lost in translation, which I think is a big shame. Yeah. Operative showdown, Jason. Yeah. So in place of the operative showdown, we kind of have just like some tips and tricks, uh, just yeah. like little little things to think about. Um, some generic concepts, like one of the ones that we flagged is using your act activation count to your advantage. Um, and actually that links right up with a little sneak peek preview when it comes to star striders for the niche tactics, where like just a, a slap shot overview of the using your activation count to your advantage. If you're playing something like um, any kind of a horde team versus elites, like Star Striders versus Intercessors, you can just wait until all six Intercessors have activated, and then you can missile somebody out there to stand next to an Intercessor and then blast them with your space laser. And that's just like yeah. pretty much the the classic example of using activation count to your advantage. Um, are there any other big moments like that you want to shout out on that topic? I mean, the using the activation count to your advantage is actually a big reason why pre in the dark that elites were so kind of like down in the dumps compared to the bigger hoarder shootier team. So pre in the dark, vet guard and pathfinders blooded were all much better than they looked on paper just because you could always wait out your opponent's activation count. And if you knew your threat ranges, you could drive models up to your opponents to cut cover lines across the board. So Pathfinders were a really, really big one for this because they could Montca, give everybody an extra dash, move past the midpoint line. So if any space rings were at the midline after they were done moving, you would be able to shoot them from a million different angles. And Vetguard could do something similar with Into the Breach, move, 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 run up, shoot, or you know just take aim. So your opponent, if they moved up to the midline, they were always in danger. So that was a big thing that changed with the release of In the Dark last year. And that was actually basically where a lot of the melee teams saw a lot of success because you could play way cagier and guarantee you weren't going to get shot on turn one. However, this concept of using your activation count to your advantage definitely still exists and is definitely a reason why commandos have basically seen a little bit of a bump because now all of their harder matchups, basically the shooty matchups, the other 10 model teams, now the orc commandos get the last play most of the time or they almost always get to tie for the last, last activation. So knowing how to patiently wait out your opponent's bigger models is a really big part of the game and a big reason why elites can be so punishing for uh, new players playing against players who are good. One of the secrets for open play when you're playing elites is if your opponent is giving you spots where you can shoot, then you got to take those take those times to shoot and you know not to have everybody on conceal, which is yeah. always a hard one. Yeah, like I've I've seen some players, especially new newer players, that like want to hide and want to run away. But like, it's really important to realize, like, similar in chess, you want to trade pieces. So it, yeah. it's like you don't want to have your pawn like run away and hide. You want to have your pawn like run out to give your opponent like a dangling little tasty treat. And if they shoot at it, now they're vulnerable to to counterattacks and and just like turn that into a trade. 
Yeah, it's a good spot to show off why smoke grenades are so powerful for someone like Phobos, where if you shoot someone on turn one and drop a smoke, you just can't get shot until turn two, which can be very powerful. And a big reason why, you know, Phobos with a bunch of smokes can be so useful, because you can have other models basically stand in the smoke with the original guy and shoot through with your favorite strategy, all in cursor Phobos, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that tangles in with one of the other topics that I wanted to throw into the general hints. It's kind of one of the less talked about ones. Um, but just like, it's really, I mean, maybe this is just me, but it's really fun to be a hipster and just like dive in on something that's overlooked and turn it into something that's like abusively powerful. Uh, you, you know, like, who knows how much this would hold up outside of of Minnesota, but Things like the the all Phobos, uh, the Phobos all in cursors. It's just the fact that the the only thing you have to think about for like your tricks, you don't have to worry about like special little abilities and anything like too tricky. You just know that every you've got six Space Marines that ignore obscuring, and like if anyone that has been watching all the the tenth edition forty k drama, it's kind of like towering but even more abusive. Because, like, towering in 40k is if I can see you, I can shoot you. And if you see me, you can shoot me. But ignore obscuring is if I can see you, I can shoot you. But I'm still obscured and you can't shoot back. So having, like, six space marines that can shoot through this one-way mirror, and that's the only thing you're thinking about when you're playing, can set up some really ridiculous plays. And just, like, crazy, crazy alpha strikes where you can just do an enormous amount of damage before your opponent can even swing back once. Yeah, because the important thing here is that smokes give you obscurity, which means that all your incursors can shoot through one smoke, basically with impunity. So if you drop a smoke on a midpoint vantage, it's relatively easy for Phobos to get to that position. And if you can get there quickly and double shoot, you can get a lot you can get a lot going that your opponent wasn't ready for. Especially when mixed in with the elite reconnaissance or whichever tack op basically lets you switch positions of models, you can actually do that. I'm pretty sure you can do that multiple times at the beginning of the game. So you can redeploy everybody into one bubble, sit them up on a smoke grenade and just start blasting on a just Vanguard position. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty gnarly. Yeah, I think Elite Reconnaissance does not call out that you can only use it once. So if you wanted to, you could use Elite Reconnaissance up to three times at the beginning of the game, move all six of your Marines into one spot after baiting your opponent on open play, then Vanguarding up, moving up into one position with a smoke and just... <laughs> Yeah, you probably have to save because so, you. Yeah, you should. You you probably shouldn't use it three Vanguard. times. Yeah, you probably uh, shouldn't use elite reconnaissance three times, but you could. I'm just saying that like you can do that. Just basically bait your opponent out. And one of the other cool things about elite reconnaissance, if you do it correctly and you set up your opponent so they think that they have to take either recon or fortify to build up a good position, you can basically take the alternate to get first elite reconnaissance into a good position vanguard up bolter discipline and just run up and start blasting hammer people yeah yeah and then like that whole outlook has even has changed has several things where i don't even bother with the mine layer because if he's spending his actions laying a mine and hiding that's just not helpful like if you if you use like if it's heavily terrain dependent but if you can be obscured on turn one and just not give your opponent a shot through sheer obscuring you can have your entire team on engage and you don't bother with sneaking you just shoot through obscuring and then all you need is one spot once that gives you like an obscured shot in a place that would otherwise be open so that's a single smoke grenade and then other than that you want consistency that phobos otherwise lacks so you put a purity seal on the sergeant he's hitting on twos if he shoots twice that's eight dice one reroll is going to give you very good results same concept applies to the Incursor Marksman, also hits on twos, give him a purity seal. Now you've got two super killy shooters and one smoke grenade to set up to enhance your alpha strike, since there should be a lot of natural obscuring that you can abuse at the beginning of the game anyways. And then just to plug that gap once, you get that, you get that smoke grenade. And then basically the idea there is you break the back of your enemy, and then after that you can start trading Phobos, because they're pretty squishy once you start actually shooting and fighting them but if you do it right you can pull off some games where people are frustrated with never being able to pull off shots and they're just getting hammered by no cover bolt guns yeah 
I mean, one of the ways that I would play against that if I were playing someone like Compendium Guard is making sure that I've seen all six of your activations to start and I just play like a coward at the beginning. So one of the ways that like a uh, for, you know, to bring it all back, the activation count, if I was trying to play against this on open for someone with a Compendium Guard where I have four different or five different AP2 guns between the the Guard Melta, the Scion Melta, the Guard Plasma and the Scion Plasma would be the plasma that I would the leader. And the plasma pistol on the leader. I would send out my dorks to go do the mission actions. You can kill them, but after you finish committing, I know where you are. As long as I don't lose double digit guys in the first turn, then next turn I can set up all four of my plus one APLs from the comms guys. So that on the next turn, depending on where you've positioned to get your obscurity shots, I can have people run up their 10 inches with move, move, move and take aim to get a gun line shot because there's only six space marines and you have five ap2 guns so if you're aiming it properly even after surviving the first set of ignores obscuring shots theoretically you should be able to make it to the midline and push up and run up to get those other shots so that would be kind of like the level one engagement and the level two engagement of reacting to your opponent trying to abuse obscurity because the moment you see your opponent take all phobos or all corn or any of these kind of like very meme teams you should be able to kind of adjust your gameplay around that. The beautiful thing, though, is if no one else is doing it, like, no one is ready for it. Yeah, exactly. So, like, you know, on a tournament side, if I saw someone do this in tournament, I would be thinking, like, all right, what is the rule that you're ignoring? I think a lot of the times when people see someone like a Void Dancer player, they get to ignore a lot of the rules because they fly a lot. However, they have a lot of six-inch guns. So the way you react to a lot of six-inch guns is that you have to look for ways to get shots off on turn one. I know that they have the... What was it? Oh, man, it's been so long since I've actually had to deal with this. Is the... Basically the Super Conceal. But Super Conceal on the Void Dancer troop is nerfed compared to the Compendium version. So all you have to do is get within six inches. So if they're playing engaged, domino-fielded Void Dancer troops, the way to cut that is they only have six-inch range. So if they want to do shoot, they have to be on engage, which means that all you have to do is make it up to a position within six inches to get the gun off. So it's reacting to what your opponent is taking. That is one of the big things that tournament players have to get good at. And I think, you know, on the East Coast, we've got a lot of super regular tournament players. So I've seen people catch up on this reasonably well but void dancer is still kind of presenting an issue for some players and one of the big ways to get around that is to know your opponent's charge ranges at all times so when your opponent is moving models that are charging models being able to take a six inch or a nine inch ruler i know that lester's workshop he makes nine inch rulers you can take that and just like basically place that around every model so you have like a nice visual bubble so that you can mark off where you're safe to go yeah, and uh, I also want to shout out the the next episode on the the corn situation that I've been doing lately, where uh, just kind of it started off as a joke. I was going to run Legionary as all corn, and it was just a fixed roster, and um, it's it's like it's uglier than I thought because of how outrageous perpetual aggression is. If every time you kill someone, you can do a three inch charge into another enemy. Like, link that with fight twice, link that with the extra crit damage, link that with you auto, like, every time you hit, it's automatically a crit. You can do some crazy business, like, um, one of the models on the roster that I take is the Butcher, which is a pretty silly and questionable choice. Um, but I give him the Grizzly Trophy, so enemies have minus one attack, and I give him a combat knife, so I'm, like, pretty stacked on this guy. If you attack him, he pairs you out with a knife. And then if he attacks you, he's only going to do so if he's just going to clobber you with a single 8 damage hit. Um, and then yeah. he does that and missiles around until he's low on health. And then he could even kill a 12 model. Like, if he's got 2 health, he can kill a 12 model enemy in one activation. Where you just charge, you strike with a, the with a knife, you've got the plus 1 crit damage, it's 6 damage. They kill you back, you fight on death, which is something that Korn can do. And then you hit him one more time, that's upgraded to a crit, that does six more damage, and now your two-wound dude just killed a 12-wound model. Yeah, just because the tactical ploy counts as a whole extra attack, correct? Um, yeah, so it's... Because you roll one, one new dice as if you're the attacker fighting in combat, since you're still, you still charged, you're still getting all of the benefits. 
Yeah, so it's a nice, cool little way that you can use a combat blade, which is much more consistent than the butcher's axe, just because it has uh, five attacks. Actually, what you can do is you can use the butcher's knife, and then you can swing back with the actual uh, was a double-headed chain axe for Relentless, right? Yeah. And and in general, that thing is super gnarly. Like, if you go into... If if people have eight wound or less models, you can run up into a cluster of people, swing once, it's automatically a crit. Reap actually matters now because you've brought all of the surrounding people down to five wounds, and if any of them hit you, you hit them back with a knife for an instant kill. Yeah. yeah I mean, the Butcher's got a lot, of, a lot going against the seven wound models. It's always just been whether or not you can actually make it into the lines and whether or not your opponent is giving you chain lightning effects. So it's not impossible, and it's been a while since I've seen someone really try to push corn uh, holistically. I know that between Nova and the Goonhammer Open, one of the guy, one of our guys, Bob, he was playing selective corn, and I think he had an extremely strong effect against Leander Starstriders. Leander's also going to the Atlanta Championships, and I think he wiped his board at the end of two, just because he had two, one or two corn legionaries, basically make it to the midline. Leander was not ready for it, and then it just. Uh, you know, you just crush like three models per model. And then there's still a it's still a 12 wound uh, three up save model that, you know, for the Star Striders is still a somewhat tough nut to crack if the laser beam doesn't go off. And if the laser beam misses on the Star Striders, it does not, it's not a even, good matchup. The thing that's even uglier than that is if someone gives you a single hanging model, if they try to bait you out with a pleb, the the fact that you can move like the corn charge, including the three inch after you kill someone is is actually a 12 inch charge so if you it's the the first target is is only momentum to get you the extra 3.9 inches oh yeah, yeah. because you can basically sw use your first charge to swing around to the back side of the model if you're well within charge range and then push out from there to yes. kind of extend and your then, charge range and then like the bubble to get from one model to the next is actually like five inches and if you have to spread your whole team out to be five inches away from each other, first of all, that's literally impossible unless you've already been tabled by everyone else. And just like the profound effect of this has been incredibly amusing. And like I said, some of the, the ugliest games are stuff like the Shrive Talon does this, just like blasts across the whole universe, uh, slides over to someone else, kills them, puts the minus one APL onto someone else, moves into them. They can't fall back. You've just done a 14 inch charge. If they do, they can't fall back. And if they do charge you, you fight first and that butchers them also. So it's like this impossible to solve little like murder chain lightning. Um, yeah, damned if you like, do, damned if you don't. Yeah. And then like between a, a gunner with a melted gun and then a chosen with a plasma pistol, I always take assassinate target. And people, you know, like if, if someone shows up with all corn and they're like assassinate target and like you know goofy business like uh that what's the one it's like unstoppable butcher or whatever people mm -hmm. are gonna, are not going to take you seriously but then all of a sudden you do a 14 inch charge and shoot a plasma pistol and then you've just killed the assassinate target and it's like whoa that was nuts yeah i mean corn all corn all basically skew lists do you have the ability to really surprise people i know that people are always surprised when they play against you know, Corn Legionary would be a good one. I think when Nurgle Legionary first showed up, people were very, very surprised at how tanky they were, just because being able to reduce damage down to two was a really big deal back then. Obviously, that's been nerfed nowadays, but skew lists have always been very powerful, and I don't think that has really changed. Yeah, definitely want to see yeah. more pure corn out there. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think Selective Corn is a little bit easier for people to brock, and then you have a slightly stronger anvil to hammer with but all corn definitely when the team first came out i know locally a couple players were experimenting with it and finding okay success it's just whether or not you can actually do a first turn all the way safe which has always been the struggle i think when you're all corn yeah because uh, if you can't and you know on all in the dark maybe it's maybe it's fine you know on in the dark, if you guys if you guys have any uh, experiments on in the dark with corn you know we'd be we'd love to hear it on the discord also, if you have any crazy hipster tactics and want to go off on a rant like I just did, but about your version, also join and rant about it on the Discord. Yeah. I think uh, this week's niche tactics, I think we're going to be talking about Star Striders a little bit, right, Jason? Niche tactics. 
good old Star Striders. Yeah, we haven't had a whole lot of people come in and bring this up, but they are a cool team. They're a good team. They've they've done well at a bunch of different events, and um, you know, not yeah. as many people I mean, are I talking placed, about it as I would have expected. Yeah, I placed eleventh with them at Kill Team Open, which you know wasn't their best format. Their biggest problem matchup is always elites, just because the twelve to fifteen wound count models are really rough for mostly human guardsmen stat team they only have 10 models they do have the big laser beam of doom which is a very very important part of the kit basically the star striders have access to a capital ship floating in low orbit and they get three different weapon profiles and before their laser beam was buffed to relevancy their hardest matchups were elites by a large margin and the elites definitely kept the lid on how powerful the team could be the first set of buffs that GW did was to give their 6-7 AP2 gun 3-up ballistic skill, which meant that you could somewhat reliably expect it to kill one elite. But as every player who knows, 4 dice on 3s is not a guarantee when it comes to shooting a marine. Because you really do need all 4 hits to guarantee something, and getting 1 hit is not common, but it's not doesn't not happen in a tournament. With so being six, able to stock up all that two, CP... You just need 3 yeah. Yeah, you Unless need intercessors. You need, uh, yeah, intercessors need four hits basically, and then for the elites uh, against Nurgle, you actually also still need three hits because the six gets reduced to five. So you actually all, almost always need four hits against most elites. Phobos, being the squishier armored cousins of both of these buffer dudes, just get absolutely laser blasted by three hits. Yeah. Yeah, but everyone else needs the four hits, and before the changes, the team definitely struggled. One of the important things for Star Strider players to know is actually how big your actual threat bubble is. So on open play, you can do a recon move, a normal move, plus Undaunted Explorers, which gives you plus one, or New Frontiers, which gives you an extra inch of movement, a dash, which is another three inches. So we're all the way up to 13 inches. And then you have a two inch bubble where you kind of ignore all the obscurity rules. So on a long side deployment, when you have three inch, a three inch bubble, you actually have an 18 inch bubble that you can shoot. So once Space Marine players have activated, if you took the recon dash, you can be in a position where anywhere within 15 inches of your starting position is now in danger of four attacks on threes, six, seven, AP2 laser beam, deleting a Marine. Yeah, so, so if you just like recon dash one of your, your armsmen, because it, it has to be one of your armsmen or uh, one of those related models to do that, just like three inches up the middle, then that bubble covers most of the board. Whereas if you go yep. up, up one of the flanks, it's a little bit less threatening, but still. Yeah, amazing. you can take your leader or the five army guys to call in the laser. And the important thing to, about that is it doesn't have to be a, per a person that needs to activate. So the, when you're playing Star Striders, you effectively have an 11 activation team. And that is a big part of them being strong against elites now. Whereas before, elites were just so tanky that even if you did this, you couldn't reliably get a marine. And taking that first marine down when you're a 10 model team actually matters a lot. Because it going does. from a 5 versus 10 to a 6 versus 10 is a huge difference in how much reliability your team actually needs. Yeah. And like yes. the, the laser beams are extra cool because not only is it a separate activation, but it uses the eyes of one of those troopers we mentioned earlier. And it could even, so that's just like your line of sight and obscuring. And that trooper can be on conceal. That trooper can be already activated and can still call yeah. in the laser beam as another activation. So yeah, you can almost you really imagine in practice. Yeah, you can it's... almost imagine the laser beam as a silent operative. So any of your models can be on conceal and do it. So my advice, if you're an elite player playing this matchup right now, is to just not go up to the midline and give the Star Striders player a shot. So I know it's very tempting, you know, to go push up to the midline to go collect VP. But if you do it in the wrong way and your opponent knows, they will laser beam you. Really I will laser beam you. an elite 100% of the time. Yes. Yeah, and then... Um... So they do have an easier time against the the more hordy teams. Um, a couple of the other profiles, uh, one of them is basically just like a bolt gun blast. Is that four or five It's shots? Uh, four attacks on threes, three, five. And then the other one is five attacks, or on fours. Everything's on fours now. That was the big nerf. So originally their first buff was to push their privateer support assets to three up ballistic skill across the board. And... Similar to how the Commandos matchups got a little bit too easy with the Excavation, this is a change that made the Horde matchups too easy for the Star Striders. Because you effectively have 10 hero units, or 7 hero units and 3 dorks, 
against a horde team which has you know six or seven dorks versus you know their six or seven heroes and then the guided shell and the cluster bomb were the two blast profiles they both have five attacks one of them is three five blast two and the other one is five attacks on fours two three blast three so it's a frag grenade with blast three and on in the dark it just made the horde matchups basically impossible because you had five attacks on threes three five or two three blast two or blast three lethal five because obviously they're still blast so they still get the lethal five profile on in the dark so it made the horde matchups almost impossible now at four up it's pretty reliably going to do something but it might not just delete a whole portion of the map which is what they were doing before yeah and like blast three if it, it like is bigger than it sounds if you put like a four inch circle over something and then you put a six inch circle over something like the volume added is pretty enormous. So, yeah. so blast three, that blast really, really hard crunch a lot of people off. Yeah, right? and on open, it means that those matchups are very, very easy for you to find AA spots somewhere on the board, especially with new frontiers to give yourself the extra inch of movement to slide a dude up onto a vantage point to basically threaten this humongous blast bubble, which is an important part of those matchups that got nerfed. One of the other good strategies that yeah. Star Striders had, I don't know if, how many people know this, but obviously Recon is one of the best tack tar- op archetypes right now because Recover Item is so easy, not easy, but so predictably able to do on turn one. And because the Star Striders have a dog model with an 8-inch move that can Recover Item in the middle of its move, they are also great at doing Recover Item. So the dog can move up eight inches and then another three with dash. And at any point in that 11 inches of move, you can pick up the item for free and move back with it. Yeah, there's kind of a fun story on uh, a silly story on that note. Um, when I did the the team doubles at Adepticon uh, on the stream table, because we hit the, the, the top table for the last game, um, my my friend that I was there with was going to do recover item and there was one spot on the board that was super obvious and when he was going to place his token in there just the last player's token was still there it was just kind of funny like, great minds think alike yeah there's only so many spots for a good recover item one thing I will say as a recover item predictability juke which is nice is that you can pre-measure out to a spot that looks good and then have your opponent kind of like set up and then just place item somewhere else as a juke. Maybe not the most sportsmanly yeah. thing, but it is also <laughs> totally acceptable within the bounds of the rules because you're really just measuring and people can expect something and you're like, ah, oh, a little bit of sleight of hand. So that can give your dog a spot that your opponent really wasn't expecting, a whole new whole new spot to go be brewed with. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes to placing the token in general, you're kind of looking for something like if there is a little, if there's like, you know, one of those Octarius ruins, and it's a tiny bit over the edge. If you, that's heavy cover, so they're not going to be able to hit you. They're not going to be able to get in there, and you can just like put that in the enemy's territory in that little corner, for example. So you're kind of looking for little like tucked away areas in heavy cover, so that people from vantage points um, can't get it. And you obviously want it to be like pretty much right on the center line, so that you don't have to overextend too much and get into your enemy's yeah. threat bubbles. One, one big mistake that I've seen players make is. A token is just a representation of a point on the map and recover item is very specific that it needs to be in your opponent's territory, which is literally a point. So you just have to measure just over the midpoint line. And that is technically by all definitions in your opponent's territory. It is not the full size of a token and it is a one inch bubble from there. So I oftentimes just use a one inch circle disc, which I have and just place it on the midline a little bit on my opponent's side. I'm like, as long as I get my dog my drone or my crew hound can touch that. Everyone is on the same page that this is clearly recoverable. Yep. And then technically your model is even in your territory while recovering oh, yeah. it from your opponent's territory. That is, And especially if it's like one of the dogs and you've got that little bit of extra movement to get a little bit further outside of that enemy threat range. Yeah, it's uh, very, time. very powerful. So know that it's going to come up the, you know, they get recon and they get security and their tech ops allow them to do either side. And the Warren of Trade lets you actually mix and match. I generally just take Recon or just Security. So I haven't really done a whole bunch of mixing and matching, but not bad. But the most important operative, I think, on the Star Striders, outside of the two obvious power pieces of uh, Vayne and the Assassin, is Void's Master Niche. Because he does both an aura bubble, which is really important, and he's a goddamned hero all by himself. 
Uh, he's got uh, like a just a scratch. Type he thing. comes with a rosary effect. So because he's, you know, he's super cool. He's got the rosary just a scratch effect. You can also layer on Undaunted Explorers, which is as long as one of your operatives is on an objective or within six inches of your opponent's deployment. The first time they get struck by a dice, you can reduce it by half to a minimum of two, which means that between that, his four up save and just a scratch, you can make a surprising amount of fire if your opponent isn't ready for it and then just not die, then pull out his two guns and start shooting. So generally, I've equipped him with the bolt pistol upgrade. So instead of a last gun that's balanced, he has a three, four balance profile. So four dice on threes, three, four balanced. And then he has the shotgun, which is four dice on twos, four, four. And if you're within six inches, you can fire both of them at any targets you want. So he can do a lot of work. Yeah, that's a surprisingly scary profile for a, a normal looking yeah. human. Yeah, and then the other really good thing about him is he gives a six inch bubble of balance to all of the other Void's men, which are the Rotor Cannon and the Three Guardsmen, which means that yeah, that's which amazing. means that he pairs up with a grenade caddy. So, and the important thing about all of the auras on the Star Striders is all of them do not require visibility. So, on in the dark, especially, you can have the you can basically have the bubbles go around corners and just be fully out of visibility. So the medic can support like the back half of a room and give no injury within that bubble. And then Void's Master Niche can also do something similar, where as long as you're within four inches of him, you get balanced. So being able to chuck a crack grenade or a frag grenade against you know the either the elites or the horde teams with balance, a frag grenade with balance is very, very good against Vetguard. Because generally, you know, four dice on threes, you're going to get like two to three hits. But if you can get three to four hits against a clump of people, it's very, very good. Yeah, it's can't be understated. That is very, very yeah. good. And then the cool thing about the Void's Men is there's a well-drilled ploy on the Star Striders, which means that if someone has been shot at, then the other Void's Men, or Void's Master in this case, uh, can get relentless. So you can have a dork pop up, take a shot, and then have Niche come in afterwards and get Relentless. And then, you know, going from four dice on threes, three, four balance to four dice on threes, Relentless, and then four dice on twos, Relentless, means that you're going to reliably put down basically eight wounds in, or like eight eight dice into six defense, which is a lot for some teams. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I also want to do a shout out for the, what's the electric guy? The Electro... The Electromancer, like yeah. The Mission Doer and the Defense Bubble Giver. Yeah, that's a sweet piece just because like the the whole electrical bubble, if someone like, char- like it, well, first of all, sometimes make people think twice about charging or moving into a certain area. And if they're just bold enough to do it anyways, like they might even take six mortal wounds and now all of a sudden it's easy for your plebs to just run in and like yeah i have melee something that they shouldn't have been able yeah to. i have used the voltageist field to good effect where you know there was one charge lane i put my guy on conceal in the room behind a barricade and it's like all right the bubble is on you run in the room maybe you die because he had six wounds left walked in took d6 took six died and we were like all right i guess that's the game <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but don't sleep on that guy's profile <laughs> like either. That, so one of the good ways to use him offensively is if you put on lethal proximity, so you get balance within four inches or six inches, and then you take your pistol that is now lethal four. So four dice on fours, lethal four, 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 splash two. And with balance means that you can chunk a lot of stuff just because of the extra splash damage. Yes. And additionally, that free mission action thing is no joke. Just like that's in general any tool that you can find a way to get a free mission action is something that you should really be abusing because that can that can really really free up your action economy to have everyone do what you want them to do yep yeah he's i mean definitely powerful tool. the important thing about star striders is you got six heroes and four dorks and if you use them properly those six heroes can do a ton of work because there's overlapping bubbles which is nice so one of the big one of the big level ups for the Electro Maester is he gives reroll defense bubble within four inches. But if you do it on an invuln save, the invuln saves never get reduced by AP. So you can have the Death Cult Executioner or Vayne take a surprising amount of AP two shots just because you're getting four dice against what is generally a good shot. And you can still take cover with invuln saves. Yeah. So if you have Vayne in cover within four inches of the Electro Maester, you can have her take an AP two shot. And generally, she's not going to die. 
And then after she doesn't die, because she's got four dice saving on fours with one in cover, so you're effectively rolling three dice trying to save, you know, one or two hits from most most AP guns. If she survives, you can then use your tactical ploy that heals her four wounds. Survivalist. So she can just take yeah, the hit, even then just like heal up with undaunted experience. Yeah, and then just shank someone. So yeah. You can you can yeah. the whole team can take a surprising amount of fire as long as you layer on all of your buffs. And one of the good things is your medic, she can save people, but she can also give a no injury bubble. And the no injury bubble is almost just as useful sometimes because it's a six inch bubble. So you can have people run into in the dark rooms or just on open fields who are already kind of injured to go get a full full stream of dice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good team. Yeah, they're they're super fun. They're a high finesse team just because you only have so many wounds to go around because you only have 10 models. They all have seven, seven or eight, like six or eight wounds. So there's really not that much room for mistakes, but they're very fun to play. And they've got some classic combos, just like the uh, the medic, medic and long range gun. But if you give both of them a flash visor, they don't take any APL penalties so they can you can have your rotor cannon just kind of sit out in the open. He gets shot, he runs away, and then the medic is still free to go go about her business the rest of the turn because she can take minus APL without penalties. Yes, it's a strong yeah, combo. Yeah, it's a combo that's seen in Kasserkin and Exaction Squad, and I would definitely suggest that if anyone is playing on those teams to look at those combos because the no APL subtraction when you're doing medic stuff means that your medics are free to go help other people or you can have a couple people that the medic can basically save over the course of a couple turns and it can be very very frustrating in shooting matchups because it's just like you got back to apl that your opponent wasn't ready for yes yeah because if you think about it what you can do is you can have a guy stand out in the open take a shot your opponent shoots and kills him he runs back into cover they both technically get minus apl and then next turn he can move out and take a shot that your opponent just wasn't ready for it's almost like you are reverse commsing and getting an APL that you weren't supposed to. So it's yeah, it's super powerful. I would definitely suggest uh, anyone who's playing on Star Striders or Caster Can or Exaction Squad to take that combo and use it because it's it's great. Yeah, Bobos could do it too, but I don't know if that infiltrator selection is the popular choice. But you could theoretically do it with the medic, the Helix Gauntlet saves someone, and then uh, no no fear to ignore the APL penalty. Yeah. So, I mean, Star Spriders, anyone who's uh, looking to get these things, you know, one of the things that I will say about Star Spriders, if you do want to learn a new skill, they're a very good team at teaching you the aura bubble concept where other optives have to support each other. I know last week we were in the Pacific Northwest with Tyler. He, we were talking a little bit how novitiates can also do something similar. So being able to keep aura bubbles in mind is really important for these larger horde teams. Vet guard don't have to do it as much because they only have the one guy that really cares about the aura bubble. But when it comes to star striders, pathfinders, uh, blooded and novitiates, you do have to keep in mind a lot more kind of pairs or triplicates of models that all kind of support each other. So it gives you a good idea of positioning. And one of the fun things about Star Strider is you get very heavily rewarded for keeping things like Voidmaster Niche's reroll bubble, the Medic Aura that gives no injury. All of these things can feel very rewarding because you can just practice like one of these things at a time in a tournament play. Yeah, definitely a sweet team. Definitely recommend it if you're looking for a new one. All right, man. I think that's uh, I'm all out of I'm all out of niches today. What about you? Yeah, I think uh, same. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, that was a fun one. Thank you for, thank you listeners for listening all the way till the end. And definitely be sure if you haven't already joined the Discord, join the chat. Join the Discord, you know, obviously any help on the Patreon would be very lovely and very appreciated if anyone has the, has the desire to help us keep this podcast going. Uh, we've got the New York Open coming up. Sounds like Jason's got the Renegade Wargaming Tournament coming up. So if anyone's in the area and wants to come hang out with either of us, please give it a listen. Or give it a look. <laughs> <laughs>